Well, well, that's interesting because I've been waiting for that for years. Um, technology people have, in general, suffered by not having a union. And um, I saw that in the, the news articles today. Let me uh, bring it up. For at least 25 years now. Yeah. Um, so. Right there, the third one. That's right. The Kickstarter, this is these kids guys tried to unionize Kickstarter, and so they fired everyone immediately that dared to suggest this, which I think is the typical reaction. There's never been a programmer's union. There's never been a security worker's union. There's never been a hardware maker's union, as far as I know. And everyone has been sort of baffled. And I think it's true of all of America, not just tech. Unions are not protecting workers at all anymore. And I think this is a large part of the gigantic gap to where um, a bunch of people now that a generation ago would have had a full-time job and enough money for a house and kids are now have like a part-time gig and not enough money for anything. And the people on top are richer than ever. I'm, I'm one of those examples, Sam, for, yeah. for X amount of years now. I know, and I think a lot of people are, and I think this is why um, people like Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders have a lot of supporters, because they want to seriously do something about that. They want to uh, basically have a kind of uh, leftward shift towards more socialism and safety net. And one way to do that would be to revitalize unions. The unions have been greatly harmed, and there was another decision a year ago to harm them again. So, you know, the way we got out of this before, well, probably the way we got out of it was a war. That's usually what does it. Because you people pull together, unite against a common enemy. But anyway, there's also an issue of making social safety net here uh, after the Great Depression. And a lot, of, and that's basically what the leftist Democrats want to do. So we have an opportunity in the next election to make that true by actually electing one of those people. Um, I don't think anyone is ready to do it, though, because, I mean, there's a, America has 40% of people like Trump and 60% of people hate him, but only half of those people vote. So they don't, they, they like to say they're angry, but they don't bother to get out and vote. So if the Democrats can somehow motivate their people to vote, then they'll win. And that's what Obama did. But most of the time, Democrats don't have anybody that actually makes people get out and vote. And I don't think it's going to happen this time either, but we'll see. What happened last time, I was, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, I was up for Matt and Bernie, but uh, a lot of people were. See, I got a chat coming in. For the boss of the sock, I cannot find Enterprise Essential on Splunk. All right. Well, I'll take a look at it. Watching, I don't know the answer. Um, you're ahead of anybody in boss of sock V2. Um, maybe I didn't install it. Thank you for telling me. Okay. Uh, let me make a note of this someplace so I can try to figure it out. Um, all right, uh, is this it? That is it. Good. All right. Good. I'll take a look at that later. You, I think you're ahead of everybody, and I haven't even done the, the V2 one. I've only done like, the first few of them, so I'll, uh, I'll do some more of them and make a clear mark in there of how far I've gone. So the, the hints you have there are the hints from Splunk. And the, I find the hints from Splunk to be spectacularly unhelpful. They, they do not tell you to do what I find useful to do things. I think they think very differently than I do about how to use the product. Anyway, I've got a few more news articles. Um, it might be interesting. The FAA one? Yeah, it's only loosely connected to the FAA, but it is an interesting article. And uh, all right. Uh, so, yeah, they, uh, Trump apparently really wants to do something about all the homeless people in California, which that would be nice if he could do something. But I think what everybody finds is that you have the legal right to just hang out on the street and nobody can make you go into a concentration camp or mental. They'd have to have them committed mentally, which I think they could do. That's what they used to do was to be declared incompetent, uh, danger to self or others and locked up. But anyway, he's supposedly trying to do something about it. I imagine this will be something he cannot do. No, nobody's been able to do it for many years. Ever since they changed the tax code in California, so they don't have enough money to pay for the mental hospitals, that's, that's what caused this problem. So what year did they change that code? Like I think that? it was 79 or something. It was part of it was Prop 13. Because um, property values rose so fast in California that people who owned houses were having to pay ever-increasing taxes to where they couldn't afford their homes anymore. 
So they passed a law that if you own a home, the property tax will never go up. And that meant the total amount of revenue coming into the state government was greatly cut down, and they closed all the uh, mental hospitals. It was Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan was one of the champions of that. So uh, as you as came out this week, um, a union sent it out to us. The city college administrators have doubled their salary last week. Um, when they're firing the teachers and canceling classes, they've doubled their own salary. It's really amazing. Big jump up from like $100,000 to $200,000. And they do this stuff in secret. And um, when, when I put that on Twitter, one of the people pointed out also that um, this is pretty common. It's the same thing in, in Los Angeles about a year or two ago. Um, I think it's a, the, the college system is, is pretty much unaccountable. They do a lot of things here. They'll wait until the last day of classes when everyone leaves and then do something. Um, it's, it's really like the Game of Thrones. Anyway, well, the, the CCSF budget is bad because they refuse to take any corporate money. And um, they don't, anyway, it, it's, it's, it works. I used to be very, very angry at city college administrators, but now I just say they work exactly as well as the U.S. federal government. If you just look at Congress or Trump's budget, they're, they're no more crazy than that. They're no less crazy than that. Trump did the same thing, just ran a huge debt. They are not allowed to run a debt here, so they have to cut everything now. So there are going to be enormous cuts next semester. Elsevier is a racket. They've been around forever. Elsevier, if you work at a research college like UC Berkeley, you have to publish papers in Elsevier journals. They own all the scientific journals, and nothing counts except something in the Elsevier journals. You have to pay like $500 or $1,000 per page to publish things, and then you have to volunteer your time to evaluate other people's papers. And for free, a bunch of people do this peer review where you decide if papers are real science, and science doesn't count unless it's published in one of those journals. And when I was in this game, I was, I was in that institution years ago, decades ago, um, what most of the reviews consisted of was making sure that you cited that person's work because the way you got promotions and jobs was how many people cited your work. So they would say, you forgot to mention my study related in this area, in this area, in this area. And apparently they're now noticing people do this, uh, which I thought was the standard, which is they'll give you a bad review unless you reference their papers. And apparently they're pretending this is wrong and they're going to do something about it. Um, many people are rebelling against this system, but it is still the standard. And if you have a job at a research university, you must publish in these journals. Um, some people think they should do something else, but it hadn't happened yet. Anyway, uh, so you, in Texas, there was the so-called coordinated attack that took down 22 um, state agencies with ransomware. And um, this is what Steve Gibson said on his podcast two weeks ago, and it is apparently true that the way they did that was not by attacking the government agencies themselves, but by attacking their managed service provider. This is the way it's been for a long time. If you want to print checks, nobody prints their own checks. They all go to ADP, Ross Perot's company. And if you want to manage uh, customer relations, you go out, source to Salesforce, and you use these third-party people to do large parts of your business. So if you take down one of them, you affect many businesses. And that's apparently what happened. This is also how they got the credit card numbers from Target. They did not hack Target. They hacked their air conditioner company, which had so ability to log into their network to maintain the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. And once they used those credit, those credentials to hack in and ultimately get to the payment terminals and steal the credit card numbers out of RAM. And the same thing happened to BART. I mentioned before BART. There was people who wanted to protest BART by hacking them, and they couldn't hack into BART. So they hooked into a company called MyBART or GoBART or something, which would sell you BART tickets and did have about 2,000 BART customers' credit cards. So they could humiliate BART without directly hacking into BART by hacking into their business partners. And this is a huge issue. Almost every company has many connections to other companies, and that increases, increases your risk service. That door basically. Well, yeah, it's also related to the supply chain attacks. The fact is you don't really control all the stuff you're using. Far from it. You're using other people's stuff, and they're using other people's stuff until there are many ways to affect you without directly attacking you. Anyway, so um, we're up to 10 after. So I'm going to go on to chapter two here. Let me just orient people because we've had guest speakers for a while, which is a good thing to have. But now we're returning back to normal. So we had uh, this video was put up. This video, I have a video up here, but you can only get it by emailing where your homework goes and requesting it because he didn't want it publicly posted. Anyway, and so now we're going to go back here to chapter two and start doing normal chapters and projects for a while. I am going to have a bunch more guest speakers, but not on Thursdays for a while. They're going to be on other days. Next week, I have Monday and Wednesday guest speakers, and then the Monday after that. And uh, all right, a lot of guest speakers coming, and they're worth extra credit if you go to them. All right, so let's talk about 
what your book says about instant response. And this comes from Kevin Mandia, among other people. So these are the guys that created this concept of instant response for the company Mandia, which got sold to FireEye. So a computer incident, security incident, is when a person does something to computers to cause harm. So data theft is the main one when you have a breach, theft of money, extortion, people going where they shouldn't go, like a bunch of hospitals had uh, incidents where their own staff would go watch what, what celebrity was in for and then leak it to the press or leak pictures of celebrities and medical problems off. And that's the kind of thing that's a security incident. So once you have one of these bad things that has happened and it is declared to be a real security incident, then you have this process. You're going to investigate to find out how they got in and what they did and determine how big, if the fire is still going on and spreading, that's determine how big the containment should be and then remediate. Once you've figured out what's going on, then you kick out the bad guys, repair the damaged systems, uh, improve the security so they can't get back in, and so on. Um, so here you have a team of here. You have a core investigative team in the middle, and these are the people looking at logs and Splunk and uh, evidence, intrusion detection systems, and all that jazz. And they're connected to a lot of other people. You've got IT support. Um, managers, network infrastructure people on the technical side and on the business side. You've got compliance, legal, and human resources. I was very interested in the talk last week. I um, hear Alex say that the legal team, she, I thought the only people that cared about actually getting evidence about who attacked you was the, the government and the military because they can actually do something. They prove it's the Chinese. They can go do something to them. If they find it's an American, they can arrest them. But I thought companies couldn't really care less who hacked them. All they want to do is repair the damage. But what he told me is that the legal department will strongly want you to collect real evidence of the type you can go to court with because everybody expects to get sued, of course. After you get hacked, everybody will sue you. And then you will want to have proof of exactly to what extent was this our fault. Did we do something bad or was it an advanced attacker that punched through our defenses, which were up to industry standards? And that makes a huge difference in how much money you're going to lose in a lawsuit. So they actually want evidence of exactly what happened, which was interesting and important to know. So you got an incident manager who must be able to um, contact the upper management quickly and lead the investigation team. And this is the person that takes the technical information from the investigation and can convey it to the top level management that is typically not technical, or even if they have technical skills, they're really focusing on a different level. They're steering the boat, thinking about the effect on the company. They've got a remediation team leader, which is going to try to fix the technical data and lead the team that does these things to remove the harm and patch the holes so the bad guys can't come back in the same way. And all these other teams, your legal team, the people considering your compliance obligations, if you're in a regulated industry, which many of them are, um, your IT support team member and network infrastructure and all these other people, and ultimately a uh, human resource and public relations. You're going to have to, uh, when the, there was a fake security incident at the college put up by our corrupt CTO a few years ago, where he pretended the college had been infected by viruses, he hired one of his buddies to come in and pretend to find the viruses so he could pretend to be a hero. And this, he didn't tell anybody anything and put this in the front page of the San Francisco Chronicle. So the next day, everybody came in and nobody knew what to do. The workers didn't know if they should turn on the machines. The students didn't know if it was safe to come to college or anything. Nobody knew what was going on at all. And this is what you should never do, of course. If you have a security incident, you must tell everybody what they need to know. Your employees are going to ask. Is it safe to use my computer? Do I need to get a new credit card? Do I need to change my password? Your business partners are going to want to know this. Your um, legal teams overseeing you, like the government regulators that are watching you, are going to want to know what happened. You, know, you have to send out information to all these stakeholders, and you can't have them just guessing. Remember, it got so bad, people were calling me, asking me, is it safe to use the computers? And I, of course, knew nothing, but you know, it was, uh, it was a model of how I never could do this. If there had been a real security problem, you never just put it in the paper and don't tell your own staff anything. That's madness. Your staff needs to know what they should do. <laughs> anyway, so PCI is, of course, the big one. Um, and PCI is a huge problem because the PCI is industry self-regulation from the big credit card manufacturers. And this is a similar problem if you involve another huge institution in your action, for these like the FBI. Um, they have their own priorities and their own agenda. And so, but PCI's primary goal is, is not your business. Their goal is to maintain the integrity of the large credit card system like Visa. So they um, have their own goals 
and you're going to have to negotiate from that level. This is the thing that's true of almost all issues of governance and security, is there are many stakeholders at different levels, and your goals are not equal to their goals. This is why the old-fashioned thing that I've heard was what you usually want to do is not tell anybody, keep it quiet, and resolve it internally, find the employee that did a bad thing and fire them, but try to avoid it getting out. That's what you want to do then, otherwise you don't have all this storm. But now if you're a regulated industry and with data breach notification requirements, that is less and less possible. You are required to tell people and then you have to deal with their agenda. So it becomes more like the federal government's issue. So you got to hire IR talent. Now typically most companies, small to medium business, do not have any security team at all and they don't have any instant response ability at all. And if they do have a security Activity is done by one overworked network administrator who isn't really maybe only on security And so these things have to be done by consultants and especially IR which is fairly specialized You would just hire consultants like Mandy to come in and pay them to come in for a week or two and figure out what to do um, So you do outsourcing here um, And typically uh, you bring in people from your that are part of your compliance regime if you are a credit card processor. If you take credit card payments more than I think 200,000 transactions per year, the number may have changed, then you're required to be audited by a QSO, I think. A, there's a special kind of auditor just for credit card compliance. And you have to, and at, some, at a certain level, you even have to have a pen test every year for those people. So they're going to come and inspect you. Um, but if you want to hire your own IR team, which is something you have to do as you get bigger. Uh, as you get bigger, it becomes cheaper to have in-house in lawyers, in-house teams of various kinds, and eventually you get an IR team, so you try to find people who have relevant college degrees or experience or certifications or, or something. Um, so you try to figure out what you want. You want experience doing this, this is of course what everybody wants. There's a number you'll hear all the time that there's like 10, 2 million jobs in, uh, in security that won't be filled, but of course all my students say this is great, they graduate and they can't get them because all they want is people that have like five years of experience doing it. That's what everybody wants, but you can't get it. So you have to settle for what you can get. Anyway, um, but people with uh, forensic experience are quite valuable, and people, of course, that know the applications relevant to your organization. Uh, at first, when you move from like class study into the um, real business market, it seems overwhelming because there's a lot of products they use that you may not have seen, like Jenkins and Tomcat and stuff, and at first it seems overwhelming, but in fact, there's only like a couple of dozen things everybody uses, and after a while, you get used to seeing them, but there's a, uh, a learning curve there, and they, you expect to know the basic way those other things work and how to set them up. So your IR team member has to be um, detailed and organized and they have to do problem solving. Of course, this is true of all IT. People ask me, do you need to know math to do IT? And you really don't need math, but you need logic. You have a problem, like somebody can't get on the internet. You have to say, well, the cable could be broken, the whole network could be down, your wireless card might have failed to make a connection, maybe the machine needs to be rebooted, maybe it has a static address and it's been moved to a DHCP network or something. You just have to think of the options and then find a way to logically eliminate the possibilities and track down the problem. We're all used to this, and that's, of course, what you're doing here, just like a detective. You're, if there's a problem with the system, you have to gather what evidence you can and try to zero in on what the real problem is. Industry certs are out there. Um, some people get a lot of certs because they just cheat on the tests. And of course, people know that. So if you have too many certs and no actual experience or, cl or classes to back them up, then people suspect you just cheated or bought, paid somebody else to take the test or something, which is running rampant. So certs alone don't prove much, but certs can help in addition to other things. All right, so I got a few cahoots. And this thing is not moving for some reason. All right, I'll open up another tab with cahoots in it. Should be another window. Oh, okay, must have closed it or something. All right. So it's my favorites. All right. 152, 2A. All right, and I see a chat comment coming in. OSCP had this problem. Oh, yes, is that, yeah. Well, OSCP had a big problem. Uh, the OSCP has several problems. Um, OSCP uh, now, now they, for a while they wanted you to be able to have a video camera or something turned on in your room to make sure you're not cheating. But another thing came out about a, six, a few months ago, somebody published all the OSCP answers because he said they've just been using old, old machines they never update and he's tired and disgusted and they won't update so he's going to humiliate them by dumping out all the answers and that will hopefully force them to upgrade. I don't know if that happened. 
I don't have the OSCP on my shelf. It's one of the things I'd like to get, but I keep getting distracted. OSCP is Offensive Cert uh, Security Certified Professional. It is what you get if you want to be a pen tester. It's the most respected pen testing certification. So they were hacked, they were compromised. They were not compromised, but they haven't updated their machines in a long time. And people that took the test took notes, and you're supposed to keep them private. But somebody just dumped them publicly on Twitter. So, all right, here's the answer. And, and since they don't update their stuff, you can just follow this person's step to get in. And that violates, it's a hands-on test. You have to really hack into machines. You have 36 hours to do it. There's six machines and a VPN. You connect and you have to compromise a certain number of these machines. And then you have to submit a whole write-up of how you did it. And people are just cheating, getting their friends to do it. And now they can just download the answers of exactly how to do it. And uh, last I heard about a month ago, they were still not updating. They were just trying to prosecute the guy that leaked the secrets and everybody's saying, you bums need to update your stuff. And so somebody, uh, so he says now it's proctored. So maybe they have at least increased their effort to make sure you're not directly letting somebody else do it. Although I think that's impossible. How can they know? I guess you have to have a human in the room watching you. It's the only way to know. For 36 hours? Can, yeah. They, um, can they uh, take away the cert? Oh, yes. All of them can. Same with the CISSP. They can take away your cert if you violate the ethics clause. And one of the things you're not allowed to do is leak out the contents of the questions. So these brain dump sites, all the people that contribute to them are technically in violation. That same thing applies, I think, to CompTIA search, like A plus and Net plus. When you take it, you'll have to sign like a non-disclosure agreement saying, I promise not to tell other people what the questions are because that would compromise the integrity of the test. But CompTIA does update the test every two or three years. Yes. And, and a lot of the others are kind of more lax about it. Apparently, OSCP has been too lax, or so they say. And these, these hands-on tests like OSCP, where it's not multiple choice, but you're actually doing something, and Red Hat Certified Engineer is another one, they are considered by far the most valuable. But that is a much more difficult test to administer. But the idea is it's essentially impossible to cheat on it. You really have to hack into it. But if it's over the internet, then of course you could just let your buddy do it for you or something. And I'm sure that's been happening. Anyway, it's a big issue. I, I'd like to get an OSCP. I think I would find it valuable. Have you ever had the Red Hat I never had the Red Hat. Oh, I don't have, have any Linux at all. I've got a bunch of security ones and a bunch of networking ones, but I don't think I've got the Linux one. There's a Linux Plus, Linux Essentials one. I could probably get that one, but I haven't done it. The Red Hat would be nice, but it's, it's a little deeper than I, I'm interested in. And a 13 video on YouTube in oh, yeah. 2017. Um, I, just, I just need uh, time to do that. 13 hours? Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of training. Red Hat is very good. It's very advanced, and the people who get it are considered very valuable. Uh, in this business, it's CISSP mostly, but if for pen testers, it's OSCP. Those are the main ones that you want to get that will be respected. Certified Ethical Hacker, which I have, is pretty much not respected, not worth much. It's not much more than like another security plus. It shows sort of general knowledge, but it does not mean at all that you're ready to do a real pen test. All right. This is Cahoots. 152, 112. All right. So it looks like we have eight. I'll wait a few seconds to see if we got any more. What's that? I uh, yes, I think bot it is. Box three is either out now or it will be out soon, and we can go compete at Splunk with the live box three. Uh, I'll put it on Twitter when it comes out. I haven't seen an announcement yet. It should be pretty soon though, and I highly recommend it. I was on teams that won bots one and bots two. That's why I became very excited about Spot. So we should go do it. You were there. I was there. You were there for one of them, yeah. Yeah, there was a one and two. There's so I've done it twice and I team won both times. So they, give you the cool trophy? they forgot to give me the trophy the first time. They didn't have enough and they said they'd send me one of them. They didn't, but I got it next time. It's in Richard Boo's office. It's one of those we need to make a trophy case yes. to show off our trophies because the gold trophy hypnotized administration. <laughs> We need to have a trophy case like football teams do. We have several trophies to put in there, so we, we should really do that. Anyway. Uh, trophy case that yeah, yeah. I think of Gollum, the precious. Yeah, yeah. That's what it's like. It saved our cybersecurity program. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it could. Anyway, so which of these is not a security instance?
Okay, that one is the winner, of course, because it was prevented. This did not happen. You, somebody tried to do something in a bad, you just fire them, and it's not a security incident. Now, by the way, ransomware is very an interesting possibility here. This is one of the great things about ransomware. If you get infected by ransomware, the bad guy did not steal the data. So I've been hearing about the big ones, but I'm the original thing I heard two years ago when ransomware started was that if you get hit by ransomware, you are not required to disclose it because it's not a breach. They didn't steal the data. They encrypted the data. You pay the money, you get the key and you decrypt it. You don't need to tell anybody. You didn't lose anything. I don't, people seem to be telling people now, so maybe the feeling has changed here. But the original idea was this is a brilliant idea of the bad guys because if you just pay the bribe, you don't even have to notify anybody. But I don't think that's true anymore. Yeah. So if you try to steal something, or, or, and you fail, or yeah. if you try to steal something and you succeed. That would be very different. If so you if you, if you, if you broke into somebody's car and, and just jammed your screwdriver in the ignition, then you wouldn't start. Yeah. Well, I guess you're still vandalized. Right. Well, if you try to steal a car and you fail, then it is a crime and you can be punished, but it is not a breach in the security of the company. Their defense has worked. And they don't need to notify anybody. and They don't need to mobilize instant response and find out how it happened. Somebody tried to do something that failed. That's when your system worked. So say you tried to break into somebody's network, yeah. but you succeeded in only just wrecking the network. So nobody can use it. Well, that might, you might report that. That would be an ILO service condition. But then if you patched it and brought business back, you might not regard it as a security incident. And that's what people were treating ransomware as. You got ransomware, but you paid for the key and decrypted it. So all you did was you were down for maybe a day. So people said that's not a real incident. But now they seem to be reporting the incident. And I think it has something to do with many people having cybersecurity insurance as well and the FBI being involved. But I think I, the feeling I heard was that for at least small and medium businesses, if you get ransomware and you pay the fine, the, the bribe, and get the key, you don't have to tell anybody anything. It's just like an IT problem. A server is down for a while. We brought it back up. We didn't lose the data. So why would you need to tell anybody? I don't know if that's true, but um, logically it might be. You'd have to ask your lawyer. <laughs> what you need is not commonly a goal. Okay, and so of course, this is the least important thing. Until recently, I thought you didn't care at all. Now, from what Alex said last week, I'm understanding that you do need evidence of, of, the, of the attacker so you can tell to blame somebody else, but I still don't think you care about attribution. You know, attribution is where you try to guess which nation attacked you, and I don't think most companies care about that. The only people that care about that is the U.S. military because I'm not going to go do something to the Russians or North Koreans or something, but um, this is your lowest priority. These other things are crucial. You can't even fix the problem without finding out how they got in, when they got in, and everything's infected. But most, you can certainly fix the problem and resume business without ever figuring out who attacked you. That's often not relevant. All right. What's the most important ability of the incident manager? Okay, it's authority. This is in the same thing in CSSP. They push this real hard. You have to have the ability to expend company resources. You can't do anything without having the, so they have to have the ear of someone at sea level. That's, they're not able, you, the, true of any kind of security team, you must have buy-in at the top or you're just going to waste your time and get nowhere because it's expensive to implement security and you have to shove people around and make them do things they don't want to do, like change their passwords and implement logging and stop doing these insecure things. And you can't do any of that without authority. Is authority uh, is it mojo or is it? Oh, no, no it's, it's a real power, real position where you answer to the CEO and now you can allocate resources. Somebody has to be able to give people orders. So which stakeholder might have other goals more important to them? Again, that's the first one, PCI GSS. All right, looks like that thing failed to randomize again. Anyway, um, so I got 
Joe and M Hino. And who's that? Somebody in the room? Face? Okay. Ah, uh, Chinese or something? Whatever. A face, I think. This may be telling me. That's what I thought. Okay. Well, the likely suspect. Okay, good. All right. So I've got the winners. And um, all right. So let's go back to here. Okay. All right. Oh, and let me see if I can encourage this thing to move off the screen. All right. So you got your initial response, investigation, and the remediation. These are the main things you do. So initially, you assemble a team. You try to find out what's going on. You try to decide what kind of a uh, problem is there, how big is the problem. Your first issue is scope. How many systems are involved, and is it getting bigger? So you have to interview the people that reported the incident, and the IT staff, and business people, and look at logs, and make a document, say, beginning your investigation. Um, and your immediate goal here is to figure out what happened and how it happened. And you might care about who was responsible. Um, you might care, for example, who in your company did something wrong so you can fire them or replace them or retrain them or something. Uh, what many people do is just jump into re-imaging servers to make the problem go away. And this usually makes things worse because it does not patch the hole that let people in. And it doesn't even remove all of the current control points they might have in your network. And it just removes the evidence that you might need to track them down. So you have initial leads, then you create initial indicators of compromise up here. And uh, let me make this as big as I can while I can still point it. So you start with some information. There's some kind of report, like an intrusion detection system goes off or something, giving you a clue that there's a problem. So you go to the systems that that's pointed to, and you make indicators of compromise. You find network signatures or registry keys or something, and then you deploy them, which means you push them out to your system with something like a script, or you search through logs with something like Splunk to find out how many machines have the indicators of compromise on them. And now you've found interesting systems, and now you go inspect those systems to see if you can find more information, and that leads to more indicators of compromise, and you go around this circle. That's the iterative process. So you start with something like malware detected, you find out how to detect the malware, then you find the systems with malware on them, and you find out what's been done is they've had passwords stolen from that system, which are used to log in other things. Now you have to find out who's been using those accounts with the stolen credentials, and you go around and around, tracking down what happened. So as I mentioned, the fundamental most common mistake is that you do not really treat it like a security incident. You treat it like a typical IT incident where there's something wrong with the server, just the image of the server to make it run again, which is what you would do if it was just a hardware fault, but that's not appropriate for a security incident because this is an intelligent attacker. And that one server where some detection went off is probably not the only thing they've compromised. So um, you would be better to analyze the situation more thoroughly before attempting to fix the problem. So you uh, don't look entirely at malware because once they're in the system, they won't use malware and an increasing number of attackers are like Alex was talking last week. He said he doesn't use malware. He write, just he writes his own PowerShell scripts to attack the machine, custom scripts. I've been starting to write custom malware for the uh, malware analysis class. It's really pretty easy and just writing your own stuff is much better because then any virus doesn't catch you. So it's a thing. Um, using malware is kind of a low level attacker script kitty thing to do. Um, because, of course, antivirus will catch you, intrusion detection system will catch you, and so if you just learn to do some scripting, you don't use canned malware. And you can do what's called living off the land, where you just use the existing management tools provided in the operating system to do the job. You don't even have to install any new tools at all if you learn to use the right tools like WMIC is one of the good ones, Windows Management Instrumentation Console. There's a lot of very powerful system administration tools available on the server already to do all kinds of things if you learn how to use it properly. You don't really need to add malware. So typical indicators of compromise, these are just, now you could take an image of the whole machine, the whole hard drive and all of RAM, and then you'd have this gigantic pile of data that you could spend weeks coming through. And that's what cops do when they're investigating crimes, but that's not what you want to do as a incident responder because it's too slow and too burdensome. What you want to do is run a script that will just look for certain important facts and then get just those facts, not everything that's on the machine. So you're looking for indicators of compromise, things like uh, names of directories and files, events in the event log, uh, registry keys that will cause it to persist by restarting the malware every time you restart the machine, and that sort of thing, network signatures, small things that you can quickly find that will tell you, is this machine part of the attack or not? 
So there are some attempts to make standard formats for this. Uh, the one I hear most about is Yara. Yara rules are very common in the industry. It's just a language to write a pattern to match sort of like grep. Um, and many people talk about when people have like a new malware campaign, there are threat intelligent feeds that will post, there's been a new attack from this nation state and they'll publish the Yara signatures. Here's the signature to put this in your incident, incident detect system. It's a very common thing people do when people subscribe to these feeds and you can even subscribe to pay services that will give you proprietary feeds of the latest uh, threat intelligence and often in Yara format. So here's um, IOC's format, which is Mondiant. It's just an XML thing. So you have an indicator, indicator item, uh, and here's another indicator item. This is a file item, and so its name is win.ini, and here's another file item, EVT, and so on. It's just an XML-based list of things, like file names, registry keys, MD5 hashes, yeah. That's all it is. It's just a way to store any kind of data, but you put it in a standardized form, and then you can feed it into a standardized tool to try to find it on the system. Mandiant makes a tool called Redline, which they push pretty hard in some of their books, but I, in my experience, it doesn't work at all. I don't know how they can bother me. It just runs for hours and doesn't find anything. As far as I can tell, the best way to find this stuff is to write your own script. Anyway, so now you um, push out scripts. Uh, you can write scripts, or you can, if you have perhaps a commercial IR platform, which I do not have access to, there may be something that lets you feed in these rules automatically and deploy them. Um, but you have snort rules are standard for network signatures and for everything else it tends to be Yara signatures. Um, so after you deploy these IOCs, you run some kind of script on all the machines and it returns results of whether it found these hits, which are the matches. And then you look at the matching information. And of course, just like every other threat detection, it has false positives, depending on how you write your rules. Um, and I remember Alex had some good examples of this. Um, if you find a machine connecting to an IP address that is considered an attacker, that's not enough to mean it's infected. It would be a lot better if not only is it connecting to a known bad IP, but a new process just launched that has never been seen before in your company. That would be a much more accurate one. So if you write sloppy rules, you're going to get a bunch of false positives. If you write very careful rules, then you'll get less false positives. And of course, false positives are very expensive because your team has to waste their time analyzing a machine that has nothing wrong with it. And you would like to avoid that as much as possible. So you validate things and make sure that the um, hit you found actually means something is bad. Then you categorize it and keep records like what happened here, SQL injection, credential harvesting or whatever. And then you decide what the highest priority things to analyze are. Um, and of course, the first thing is things that give you useful leads to find the rest of the infection, to find out where they went. Then you preserve evidence. Um, so you'll create some kind of documentation. In the old days, you would have a whole image of the hard drive and the RAM. Uh, these days, that is considered way too much bother, and you just keep the information from the tools. Although, um, like say Alex said last week, which was news to me, that your legal team will actually push for the old-fashioned evidence. Because apparently, when you get to court in the lawsuits later, they will actually want the old-fashioned criminal evidence. So you might want to actually make images of these things. People don't like doing it because it means you it takes hours, and you have to take the machine down, and you have to buy expensive equipment like a write blocker, and then you have to have huge safe full of giant hard drives with these giant images on them. So that's why it's what real police investigators do. And I've taught that kind of forensics and studied that kind of forensics, but it's pretty expensive and a lot of work. Uh, the guy that taught me this, he said, you have an independent contractor, you always should charge at least $600 to image the system because it's a drag. And the, the cost is not only the time it takes, but now you have to store it. He has a huge safe in his house. You have to store that stuff for years, maybe forever. In fact, he said another thing, when you make a contract with your customer, make sure you specify exactly how long you're going to retain the evidence because it's real expensive to store all this stuff and it has to be in a safe because you have to go to court like five years later and testify that I made sure nobody tampered with this evidence. So you can't just stick it in a room. It's got to be in a secured room and that's not a small cost. What's that? Yep, just like the cops. Right, the cops across the real estate. That's right. The cops have this evidence room and they have to have this log book and a person making sure nobody goes in there without it being recorded. And if they don't do that right, then none of that evidence will hold up in court. It's the same issue. So um, live response is the most common method. You don't image the whole drive. You just run some kind of script to look for a few indicators of compromise. And then you get just a text file saying, I found these 10 things. I looked for these 20 things and they weren't there. So you now have a much more reasonable amount of data 
just a text file with some information listing the processes. You list all the processes, some objects in the file system, some registry keys, and then some hits. You, you have a reasonable text file, not gigabytes of data. So memory collection, you could image all of memory or you could harvest the process memory from just one process. And this is how you'd find how memory resonant malware is running. Um, typically, you don't want to image the entire memory. And if, even if you do, the problem with memory is memory has no owners or timestamps. So if you find something running in memory, it's not easy to, to figure out when it started. But it may be useful in figuring out, um, comparing it to other samples like disk files you find. A forensic disk image, as I mentioned, this is the standard gold standard of computer forensics for years. You take an image of the entire hard disk and you analyze it with a tool like NCASE or FTK, and then you're ready to go to court and convict people for things like kidnapping and child pornography and stolen intellectual property and stuff. But this is a huge job and not normally something instant responders like to do. Um, then you analyze your data. We've done malware analysis like we're doing here in ways to analyze a piece of malware and find out what it does and what harm it does. Live response is looking interrogating running systems to see what they're doing right now. And then forensic examination is the most difficult time. Um, if you're going to examine a disk image, you have to go in with some questions you want to answer because you could spend months digging through all the files on a disk and you have to, rather than learning everything possible, you have to answer a few specific questions. Like, is this machine infected? If so, what files were altered? And did it spread to another machine? So, and ignore everything else. So remediation, once you have gone through the cycle, uh, this, by the way, is something I learned back in the days of physics. In physics and math, there are a lot of problems you can't actually solve very accurately. And when you can't, what you often do is you make an approximation, and then you have some way to improve your approximation. And then you keep doing that until it stops changing. And then you say, well, I don't really know if I've solved the problem, but I do know that this is not going to get me any closer. So I'm going to call that the closest approximation I can achieve. They call that a steady state. And this is what my favorite forensic examiner taught me. He said, when you're examining a hard drive, you have millions of files you could spend forever. What you do is you start with some information like the name of the person you're looking for in emails or something, and you find the evidence, and then you find more clues, and then you analyze those clues. And when you stop finding new things, you quit. You say, well, I found everything I can. You'll never find it all, but that's what you call a steady state. So when you've gone around that cycle, and you're not finding any more new indicators of compromise that are leading to any new information, then you're done. Where you may have done whatever can be reasonably accomplished with that procedure, and now you're done. You should be planning remediation all along, preparing, now that you know what has happened, you should figure out how do I get rid of all this, and how do I block all this, and then you have a single response where you block all the doors that the bad guy used to get in, you remove all their hooks into the network, and upgrade everything, like re-image all the infected servers, and then hopefully you actually get rid of them. Once that's over, you have to monitor the network after that because it is very common that you fail. You patch certain things, you reinvent certain systems, you change some firewall rules, and you missed something. The bad guy has another way, so all they do is they come back. And you have to watch very carefully. It's very likely that after your remediation event, you will discover they're just sneaking back in, and you'll have to have another analysis and another remediation event. And that is another way to measure how mature your instant response team is, is how often you actually solve the problem the first time. So let me make sure this thing is properly randomizing. It is randomizing, all right? Last time it seemed like it was always A, but maybe that was just the luck of the draw. We'll see. What was that? It sounded like techno reggae. Techno what? The, the, little, the little song. Well, the song. It's oh, kind of reggae thing. Well, reggae is a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They've got a few of them. If it comes around Halloween, they play a different one and stuff. It's a key, I think, or it could be a duck. Or some kind of infinity sign or something? Yeah, it might be an infinity sign. It could be upside down ampersand, that's true. All right. I think I'll start in a few seconds. I'll give it another five. I'm not Red Hat certified, so there.
Maybe I should be, but I'm not. And it's not on my plan to do it anytime soon. I do the OSCP before I do that. All right. So. So which phase would include re-imaging the surface? Okay, that's remediation, of course. All right. All right. Which phase would do a forensic analysis of disk images? That would be during the investigation, and you try to avoid it as much as possible because it's a lot of work. All right, which phase would include interviewing the person who reported the incident? Of course, that's right at the beginning. Just like cops, the first thing to do is interview the people who reported it to try to find out exactly what happened here. All right. Which phase would include deploying IOCs? That's the investigation. You have indicators of compromise, then you hunt for those, then you find more indicators of compromise. That's basically what it is. It's a cycle of deploying IOCs and then using them to find more IOCs. That's what investigation is primarily. All right. So I've got um, M. Hino twice, and Joe Chong twice, and I have R. Is R equal to Caitlin? Is R in the room? All right. I'll record R, and R will get some points if and when they come out of the closet. Anyway, so, um, all right. So let's carry on here. So you got posturing and tactical activities and strategic activities. So posturing are setting yourself up in a position where you can succeed. <coughs> so you have uh, deli you know, people know their roles, people know how to communicate, people have scheduled things, so you have the right number of staff on sale. These are just ways you prepare to be successful for incident response. And then you have tactical activities which fight the current battle. So this is handling your current incident, things like changing passwords, blocking IP addresses in the firewall, changing your business process, all these things you might do to um, respond to the current problem. One problem with our whole business is it tends to be reactive. We, like the TSA, we tend to just be responding to the last attack. And this is not best. It would be better to be ahead of it and preparing your defenses to block the attack, but that's much more difficult. And instant response, of course, is intrinsically reactive. This is the main thing people do, for better or worse, is they respond after they've been hacked. Um, strategic would, of course, be better. If you make some kind of long-term improvement in your business plan, that makes your company stronger. And this, of course, is why people do things like become compliant with standards. This is hopefully a long-term organizational structure in the whole company that will make you more resilient against future attacks. That's the idea. It, may, it has its successes and its failures, but the idea is if you actually revamp the entire company and obey a lot of best practices, then you'll be stronger and you won't have so many instances. So uh, you have to track all the information. You have to keep a good document. You have to have documents to help your instant responders handle the current problem, to help your legal team prepare the legal documents, to deal with the lawsuits and stuff, to help your upper management understand what happened, you know, and to help the, keep a record so your later instant responders can refer to it in future incidents to uh, compare it to how they handled previous ones. So you got lots of information here. Um, list of all the systems, all the files, all the stolen data, and of course, chain of custody. Chain of custody is an important issue for all evidence. This is a record, like I've, if you do image a hard drive, then you, like I say, you have to take that, and stick it in an evidence safe, and you have to have a record of who is responsible for it. And the it's not useful in court unless you can have a person go there and testify that I signed that paper on this date and I made sure that thing was locked up until I gave it to this other person who brought it to court and I made sure nobody meddled with it. It's not going to hold up in court unless you have a list of who's responsible and those people can go to court and testify and swear that they were making sure nobody was meddling with the evidence. That's the chain of custody. So you have a list of act, attacker activity and the network and host-based IOCs and 
all the things your team did. You'll have a log of what you did so it can be examined. Um, I remember doing this just when I was doing my financial work at the, um, I was handling many millions of dollars at the escrow agency and I was often doing very complicated database structuring. And one thing that was very hard for me, I came from the egg-headed world of physics research where I could just work all day and nobody bothered me. And that uh, business, people interrupt you constantly. So I'd be doing something handling hundreds of millions of dollars and then people would come interrupt me and make me do something else. And so I learned to keep a log of every step. I did this, then I did this, then poof, they dragged me off. Now I come back, I have to remember exactly where I left off. So you keep track of what you did because it's entirely possible that there will be an argument later of whether you did the right thing. I got used to this too. If you make a mistake in a forensic investigation, you must keep a record of it and then say, then I did this, which was a mistake. Then I did this. You don't cover it up. You don't lie about it. You say, I did this. Uh, that's all you can do. You have to be honest. Nobody is perfect, but you have to have a record. And then it will be examined by the people above you and your coworkers and courts. And they will decide this, evidence, this mistake is so bad that means the evidence is useless and maybe you'll get fired, but you have to be clear about it. And nobody's perfect. I mean, that's, that's why you really need a record of what you did that can be examined later by various stakeholders that will want to decide whether this is the right thing to do and maybe something should be changed. Like they should make a procedure so that this mistake doesn't happen again which happened many times at my company. We had a lot of incidents. We didn't have this kind of security incident. Well, we did, we had a lot of incidents I was involved in where something would go wrong and some kind of failure in the system or payouts would go out wrong. And then we had investigations. It wasn't as formal as all this, but, but I was in it. I, several times I went to the boss to tell him that the bad things had happened and they were often my fault. Anyway, um, so you make a report, you're gonna have periodic reports to keep everybody involved, and this is important to organize your activities, and the more practiced you get as a pen testing team or an IR team, the more your reports become clear and, and you know how to do it. Correctly reporting things is very useful, both internally and externally. All right, anyway, let me get rid of some of these old ones, and I should have another Kahoot here to see, okay. I remember my first case, I made a big mistake and I went to the boss and he, he said, no, no, everybody makes mistakes. The real measure of a professional is how well you fix your mistakes. And that was a very good thing for me to hear at the time. Because you, you can't, it's not very useful to spend your time kicking people and making mistakes. What's important is how are you gonna fix it now? What's that? What university? Spunk University? Don't know anything about it. What about it? Part of box three? I don't know. I don't know anything about it, but so I'll take a look. All right. Oh, it's coming? You found the date? Oh, okay. Good. We'll look at it after these coups. Let's put it up here. I'd like to know. Is it local? Las Vegas. Las Vegas. Okay, yeah. Well, they usually have one locally. They'll have one in San Francisco at some point. Good. I'll look it up after these cahoots. This looks pretty good. Uh, wait a few more seconds, but I think eight is what we're going to have. All right. So what's the fastest, easiest, and most common type of data collection? Live response, you just run a script on the running server. This is, of course, better. You don't have to take it down. It's, of course, less accurate. If the server was compromised, your script might not have the desired effect, but usually it does, and that's the main thing you do because it's fast and easy. Changing passwords, what phase is that? I think that's tactical. That's how you respond to one incident. They often have a big password reset during the remediation phase of one incident. Yes, strategic. Now, there was a belief 
which came from the National Institute of Standards that you should force your staff to change their password every 90 days as a strategic plan to make you safer. And they finally admitted about two years ago that that is complete garbage and that doesn't make you any safer. And they said, you forget it. Um, but there were several password policies that were established long ago that in practice were not proven to have any value at all. And periodic password changes was one of them. Really? Yeah, all that, all that does is make people forget their password more and put it somewhere stupid like in a post-it or just have a series of passwords that just keep adding a number to the end. In the end result is you're worse off by doing that than you would be by not doing that. That's what they decided. Now, what's much better is to use something like two-factor authentication. That would really help you. But, right, have, but the password is not enough. It's a password plus a card or a fingerprint or something. That's a whole lot better, of course. Oh. Yeah. Batman. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, how about designating responsibilities? Where's that? All right, that's posturing. That is setting if you're organized and you know who the boss is and who the workers are, then you're more ready to go. Unfortunately, what most people do is they get hacked and then they don't even know what to do at all. And they run around scramble and lost trying to figure out who's going to do what. And of course, that's why you say we really ought to prepare for this by having a posture where we actually have a team and we know what we're going to do. Then you're going to handle the next incident much better. So who should not receive the periodic reports of the IR investigation? All right, obviously the news, this is why Trump and everybody gets mad about leakers. You don't want half-baked, stupid things going out to the media. You want to wait until it's, you have a, you're done, and now you have a properly prepared document from your, from your PR team that will say the right thing. And, well, yes, and, and not admitting to things you don't want to admit to, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Um, all right, so I bet that is... Caitlin, that funny name, and N Hino and WK. I bet it is. Let's see, what have I got here? Uh, yep. Kato Rin. That could be, yes. I'll take your word for it. So, Caitlin, I've identified. M Hino is here again. Good. And there was another one, WK. So, R and WK are going to have to tell me who they are if they want their points. Oh, yes, good. I know who you are. Okay. okay, good. You're WK, I reckon. Good. Okay. Good. All right. Uh, all right, and so let me take a look at what you say, because if there is Splunk 3, uh, that's awesome. And let's see, Splunk, bots. what's that? Something, oh, it'd be okay, yeah. All right, yeah, Boss of the Sock 3 at .conf18, well, that was in Vegas, and I think that's over, but this means there will be um, 523, yeah, so I mean, it happened there, but um, they are, well, after, after they have the, the their dot .conf 18 is their big conference, which is expensive, and I think it's over. Uh, this? Okay, October 1st. Uh, in October 19 to 21. Is that this year? Con 19. Con 19, I guess so. Yeah, so you could go to Las Vegas and do it, and after that, they'll have it all over the place. So there'll be one in San Francisco. Oh, yeah, 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 it'll be, in, it'll, yeah. So I mean, you can go to this, but this is usually expensive and all that jazz. But after this, they bring it all over. They have it all over. So it'll, I think last year it was like in November. So after this is over, November, December, they'll probably have a local one that we can get to for free. So that's when I would probably go. Although, uh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm planning to become a Splunk partner and official Splunk trainer, but it'll probably take me about a year to get all the search. Once, then maybe I'll, I'll be presenting this and all that jazz. We'll see if it happens. But I'm very interested in working with Splunk, and that may happen. But right now, I'm just a peon, so I would have to pay to go, and I'm not going to do that. 
Oh, I, I no, I'll probably check support. Yeah. Changing the account, but we'll see. None of that has happened yet, but but they have approached me, and I'm interested, and I'd like to get more sponsor certifications. I have to get about four more certifications before I'm qualified, so I want to do that anyway, and then I can see. But um, I'm very impressed with Splunk, and they're making piles of money. So, to be a trainer, you have to be a Splunk certified partner or something. And I, for, I have the first cert, and I think I need four more. So it's sort of like becoming an MCSE. It's a relatively advanced Splunk level, but I, that would be good for me to learn that stuff anyway. So yeah, so over the next several months, I'll be getting more Splunk certs. Anyway, any other questions? I'm going to stop the share then. I'll stick around here to help anybody who wants to work on projects. All right, let's do that.